Mr. Commissioner? Yeah, so, so do I continue waiting or? Yeah, uh, has it said that uh, the, there's a, the meeting is starting in a few minutes? Yes, now. Two minutes. Yes, now. Yes, now. It, Two minutes. You know, uh, yes, because it's not saying that. Yeah. But I'm still getting in and then it's still telling me the same thing that. Sure. Don't worry, just now. Okay, it's. Okay, yeah, it's just starting right now. I, we are broadcasting. Yeah, it's broadcasting now. Yeah, one, two, just three. Join. You're done. Okay, we can see you. Okay, do we start? Yeah, just give us a minute for people to join in. Okay, um, I think with Masha is facing a challenge. Okay, thanks for joining us. Um, I see we already have. We already have about 63 people who joined in. Oh, okay. um, so we'll give you a few minutes to just join in. Um, apologies that we um, are running a little late. Um, I'll just give it a few minutes to just have everyone come in. I have 100, I think 108 people who've already joined in. Oh, so we'll just give us a, a few, few minutes. Eh? That's fine, yeah. that's fine. Mm, yeah, this is gonna be exciting, okay. Um, if you're joining us, we're just giving it a few minutes, um, maybe another five minutes to just begin. Um, thanks for joining us today. This is the, an event by ICJ, the International Commission for Jurists. Um, and we, have been to, we promise to have some really interesting discussions in, in a few minutes. Um, and so I would like to, you know, uh, allow, um, do I have the... Executive Director, speak. Um, okay. um, if if you can hear us, just um, type on the just type on the chat if you can hear us. Um, and if you need to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Um, there is a feature that you can use to raise your hand and join us. We have I think 137 people who joined us. Thank you so much Great for number. joining us today. Thank you. Um, and so we're just going to begin in a few. Uh, first is just housekeeping. If you need to ask a question, um, we have a chat. I would really love your feedback. Um, thank you so much. You can hear us. Thanks, Leon, Gishana, Albert. Um, there's so many of you, Sylvia, Anna, and Johi. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so I want to just have my colleague from ICJ um, make a few remarks before we begin. Yes. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for finding time to be here with us. My name is Silas Kamanza and um, I'm a program officer at ICJ Kenya. I'm really happy to, to, to be here and I'm really happy that all of you have been uh, able to be with us today. I hope that uh, we'll have very uh, good deliberations as we go on. Uh, I know that it is quite a tough subject, but we have an extraordinary panel. Uh, uh, we have extraordinary panelists today with us who uh, will share with us uh, their experiences and their views and recommendations uh, on legal practice uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I hope that uh, we are going to have a very active uh, deliberation. Please uh, do not hesitate to contribute on our social media at uh, ICJ Kenya on Twitter and at Lawyers Hub uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we hope to have a series of uh, conversations and uh, to provide a platform for lawyers and jurists uh, across, uh, uh, not only in Kenya, but across the East African region, uh, so that we can deliberate very pertinent issues uh, regarding our legal practice during this period. Uh, thank you very much for finding this time. Uh, perhaps maybe I can find out um, if uh, all our panelists have been able to join in. Uh, um, yeah, I uh, just added Maria, um, and also we have Commissioner Mashari Anjeru, yeah, that's um, who's going to join us just in a few. Um, please help me with, uh, I'm just trying to get this. Uh, okay. Commissioner, if you can hear us. Okay. Commissioner Masharia, can you hear us? You can unmute your mic. I just um, unmuted you. Maria Mbeneka, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. 
Okay. Hi, Linda. Hi, Silas. Hi. Hello. Hi, Linda. Yeah. Hi, hi, Maria. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. I would love a program to get our other panelists going. Um, so I just wanted to do um, a, a co contextualize this particular discussion. Um, we are all coming to terms with the pandemic and we have several issues that are arising from access to justice, to the use of technology, um, to figuring out how lawyers are going to, you know, um, stretch a little bit of the pie so that they can enjoy, you know, still benefits to their farms, still be able to um, give public service to those who need, you know, legal aid in these times. And so ICJ saw it fit to organize this particular event. I'm personally a member of the ICJ and uh, the International Commission of Juries does an amazing job. I'm going to ask my fellow moderator to just talk about what ICJ does and um, you know why we are doing this today. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, ICJ Kenya is one of the is actually the oldest human rights uh, organization in Kenya, having been established in 1959 and uh, registered under the Societies Act in 1974. Okay. Uh, so we've been here for quite a while working on issues of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Uh, we have worked uh, very, very uh, closely with uh, the government, other civil society actors, and the public to ensure that uh, these issues have been, uh, to ensure that human rights, uh, democracy, and uh, the rule of law is respected, mm -hmm. and that international standards are uh, observed uh, during, uh, during even an election periods and uh, in the governance of our of, of uh, different different issues uh, and and at different different levels including the county government uh, the national government and uh, you know uh, regarding uh, other issues including mining etc so um, ICJ Kenya has uh, has in uh, for a long time, uh, worked together with the judiciary, we've worked together with the executive and the legislature. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, a, a, a very, very uh, close relationship with the public because uh, we, we ensure that we link the levels uh, of, of policy and policy reforms and research and we ensure that this actually reaches the grassroots level. Uh, perhaps with that, maybe uh, as we uh, continue, uh, I can see that uh, one of the panelists, Patrick Kujiri, is online and Christine as well. I could give them uh, a minute to basically um, introduce themselves in one sentence or two uh, about what they do and, uh, uh, you know, uh, just introduce themselves. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, we, uh, is uh, Maria yeah. there? We'll, we'll start with yeah. Maria. Um, mm -hmm. Maria, please introduce yourself. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Mbeneka. I am a council member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. I am also a member of the Lawyers Hub and the ICJ. I'm happy to be here and thanks for inviting me as a panelist. Okay. Um, thanks, Maria. How are you coping with COVID? Um, what are you doing? Uh, well, um, balancing. Balancing is uh, quite tricky. I mean, you're at home, so you're more tempted to do stuff around the house. Um, so it requires a lot of discipline. You have to get up, dress up like you're actually going to work so that you can get into the work mode. Um, I find that's what's helping me quite a bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, adjusting, adjusting to our new normal. Uh, it's not easy and uh, well we're making the most of it as a farm okay. and, and myself as an individual with, with the family setting. Okay um, thanks for that. Um, we'll go to Masharia, Commissioner Masharia Njeru. Um, if you could speak, um, I've tried to admit him but um, all right. Commissioner. Well, you can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I wish we had your video. Um, Hello? We don't understand, even if there are pets running around or, <laughs> or children, it's okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. So yeah. much. Now, um, for me, it's... Thank uh, you. you. You can see me? Yes, we can see you. All right, wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you so much for inviting me as a panelist. Yeah. It's uh, quite exciting. I'm also a member of uh, ICJ. No, no one's got any numbers. What are and, um, so, Just like Maria said, yeah. it's a very challenging time for all of us. Yeah. But uh, 
thankfully, it is not just us in Kenya, it's a world thing. Mm -hmm. I guess it's also a lesson learned for all of us that uh, sometimes human beings, I think we need some surprise yeah. for us to be able to realize that uh, we are not that powerful. Because if a small virus can bring the whole world to a standstill, that is quite uh, telling. Mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, human beings always have a way of uh, being able to see themselves through uh, challenges. This is not the first time the world has faced a challenge. And I am quite confident we should be able to go through this one. Uh, in our law firm, we decided that uh, we continue functioning as much as possible. Because one thing that I'm conscious about is the fact that uh, we would want to see a situation whereby we're able to support not only our clients, but also our staff. In fact, the position of we taken uh, as a law firm is uh, if we can ensure as much as it's reasonably practical that our staff don't go without a salary or even uh, without any uh, salary cut, we we'll try to achieve that as much as possible. That means also maintaining some reasonable mission of operations. And therefore, we are trying to use the ICT and wherever possible, we also come into the office and observing health guidelines, but also uh, making sure that we stay safe. I okay. Think that Remarks. Thanks so much, Commissioner. I'll invite Patrick to introduce himself. Um, Patrick, if you could unmute your mic. Yes. Um, we can't hear you. You have to unmute your mic. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me see if I can fix that. Meanwhile, I can just have Christine as we sort out Patrick. Okay. Christine, you could introduce yourself. Hi, Linda and uh, Silas. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, you can't, I don't know whether you can see me also. No, <laughs> we can't. Uh, I don't know why the video is off now. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Let me just uh, say hi as I figure out how to get my video working. Um, okay. So my name is Christine Konge. I work with the Katiba Institute. Katiba Institute is a research and litigation um, organization uh, dealing with uh, quite a, a lot of things around ensuring the rule of law and institutional analysis in Kenya. Uh, we have been involved in litigating try and change. Is that not Can you hear me? Yeah, you're logging in from two devices. So if you could just log out of one device. One device. Okay. All right. Let me see. Yeah, now we can hear you perfectly. Okay. So, yeah, we work around entrenching constitutionalism uh, in Kenya. And uh, just what Masharia has said, we are also trying to um, adapt our systems. So we, we've also been challenged in a positive way by COVID because now we are more conscious in ensuring we are more tech savvy as an organization. And I think this will be a, a good... Um, you know, change, positive change that comes from this COVID because we are also yeah. now, uh, you know, just updating our systems to make sure we are uh, fully capable of working yeah. Yeah. and remote. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks, Christine. I'll go to Patrick. Um, Patrick, now you can hear, uh, we can hear you now. Thanks. You can hear me now? Yes. Good morning, all of you. My name is uh, Patrick Gunjuri. Mm -hmm. I am presently the vice chair of uh, ICJ Kenya. Besides that, I am a practitioner. Uh, I'm amazed because we are living at a very, very difficult and unprecedented times, just like everybody else has said. Uh, I have practiced law for 19 years, but I have never had to close the law firm for this long, yeah. except during December. Yeah. So we are, we are all learning. We are having to, to put in measures to ensure that we are serving our clients. But I, as, as, shall we, as, as we shall discuss during this session, I think our practices are like limited because they are predicated on what happens in court, what happens in um, 
in the court registries and what happens in other other players like Kipi and uh, all those things. So we have had to innovate, uh, working from home, creating workstations from home, uh, ensuring that uh, staff are ready. And where we need to serve our clients, we have been uh, able to send uh, documentation to, to client by email. So we are leveraging on, on, on technology. So mm -hmm. I look forward to having very fruitful discussion. And I also bring greetings of uh, ICJ Kenya Chair, Kevin Mogeni, mm -hmm. uh, the council, uh, the ED, and the entire secretariat and the entire ICJ family. We look forward to having very fruitful discussions this afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you so much, um, Patrick. Um, now we would want to go into the, um, you know, the, um, the panel discussion. If we could first have, you know, different views from, from the speakers. And I'd want to start with Christine, um, you know, from the, just comparing the work that you're doing at Katiba Institute and vis-a-vis um, -vis what's happening now with the pandemic, uh, we are wondering what are the short-term measures and the long-term measures that we can employ to ensure that we still have, you know, access to justice for, you know, um, okay. So Christine, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very clearly, Linda. All right then. Um, so yeah, uh, our question is, you know, what, what short-term measures can we take and long-term measures can we take to just mitigate what the pandemic has brought with us so that we do not have, you know, limitations on, to, on access to justice? Right. Um, thank you, Linda. For some reason, I can't figure out how to turn on my video. That should show you that uh, this has, is going to be a great learning period for myself, too. Um, so oh, okay. you have a virtual background. That's what's uh, uh, preventing you from having this. Um, but yeah, we can just do the audio as we figure that out. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as Katiba Institute, as I, as I indicated, we, one of our critical things we do in a day-to-day -day basis is actually going to court on various issues around uh, constitutionalism, a rule of law, and democracy. So basically, we are looking at, um, you know, if you look at the kind of things that need to happen in terms of every, all the measures that have been taken by the government to deal with COVID, that whatever measures are taken, they have to ensure rule of law, democracy, and human rights protection, right? So mm -hmm. by, it also means functioning of parliament, functioning of devolution, and functioning of all the arms of government. Uh, by rule of law, of course, is that the laws must be followed, but, and human rights protection, of course, is very clear uh, coming from some of the things that are happening. In terms of human rights, of course, it's very clearly that uh, some of the rights that have been implicated it has been, you know, freedom of movement. Uh, you can't move as you'd want to. These issues about association, expression, assembly, um, and even some issues to do with liberty in case of people who are quarantined, uh, you know, because of this, uh, because of this COVID. So all of this has a lot of implications in terms of. Um, you know, access to justice, uh, um, access to justice for people who are in quarantine and might want to get some things done, access to justice in terms of um, other critical cases, especially criminal cases, um, and the fact that uh, those cases are not going on as they should have, uh, on, on, and there's the right to have a speedy trial, of course. So there's quite a number of things that have to be taken into consideration. So we have to look at all the sectors of our criminal system. I mean, of our, of our, our justice system, not only criminal cases, civil cases, and the, uh, and the human rights and constitutional cases, all of them have to be taken into consideration in terms of access to justice. So of course, we've been having some hits and misses uh, since the, the crisis started. I think the judiciary shut down after the very first case was announced on 9th of March, I believe. Um, and then thereafter, uh, thereafter, there's been a bunch of uh, regulations and uh, practice notices that have come out uh, indicating how people should um, go on to process the cases. Uh, initially, there was some confusion about how to process criminal cases from um, uh, for people arrested, uh, just because of the constitutional requirement, they should be in uh, in court within the 24 hours. Um, I think as as early, uh, yesterday, so a couple of days ago, I saw now um, some new directions that they should be brought to court uh, within the 24 hours, irrespective of, of what else happens. So 
the, the idea then is how do you ensure the justice system works, but still protect the staff? I mean, the judicial, the, 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 the judges, the magistrate and the supporting staff and the litigants themselves that come to court and even the lawyers themselves that come to court. So how do you ensure this happens? So that's the big question. And uh, they, they, they have been some rules um, around that. And I think they've seen something from Nakuru um, as recently that now shows they are going to have full automation of the litigation process to allow uh, for that sort of protection of everyone involved, but also to ensure access to justice happens. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I, was, I was just going to balance. chime in and ask. Um, yes. I, I think yesterday on social media, there's been cases around, you know, what you spoke about freedom of movement. We had yeah. this um, musician, uh, Ekodida, who was arrested for going out to, you know, buy medicine for his, his wife. And I think that's making yeah. you know, the rounds. I don't know what, how far that has gone this morning. Um, but how can institutions such as yourself, you know, come in and mitigate such, you know, violations of citizens' rights? How do you help in this case? Yeah. So that's the thing. With a, within every rule, there should be some reasonable exceptions to deal with reasonable things that would occur. So it, we don't actually need to, for law society of Kenya to go to court uh, to be able to uh, provide for some, uh, uh, you know, reasonable exceptions to to a quarantine situation. Yeah. So if you need to go out, uh, like your baby has a fever, you can't wait until nine, five in the five a.m. to go and get some medicine. You need to actually go out and try to get some medicine, whether you go to a hospital or not. Uh, the thing is that you, it is reasonable that, that should happen. So in every rule, there should be some measures to allow for discretion to be exercised. And that discretion should be exercised in a way that is reasonable. And, uh, and so that the idea then is whether the police are properly briefed to be able to understand what are the situations that would allow for the discretion to be exercised in a way to allow citizens to access urgent medical care and other things even during COVID. Um, I think I, I think with the police, um, and I think Commissioner Masharia, uh, from uh, having um, you know been at IPOA, would be able to comment on this. Um, yeah. People are complaining the police have you know are having a field day, and mm -hmm. we are treating isolation and um, like detention centers. You know, we are taking people to these centers, mm -hmm. but it looks like it's detention that you pay for. Mm -hmm. How do we stop this? Um, and that's my first question to you. And number two. What do we sue about? What, what areas? Because um, the law society went to court. There are some quarters who thought that we shouldn't be suing about curfews, but maybe we would focus on broader issues like you know, access to internet, not that people are at home. We could be talking about freedom of movement you know, that would touch on specific sectors of society for people who are elderly or sick, people who need to go for dialysis. Um, mm -hmm. What exactly should we prioritize in you know, strategic litigation at this particular point? Well, okay, as with everything, strategic litigation looks at the most pressing need uh, there is at that particular time. Yeah. And so it's very difficult with this situation because it's very fluid. Things keep on morphing, things, new issues arise as the, uh, as the situation unfolds. So uh, I think we, if you've, if, uh, you've been able to see the advisory we gave together with Kelly and uh, quite a number of other civil society organizations, we put areas that, um, different areas that should be looked at and, and give uh, you know, um, advice on what we think uh, the measures are. So of course there are issues to do with quarantine. I think that is quite a, a critical uh, thing to happen right now, uh, especially when this, I, I disagree with the government by saying this is a voluntary agreement you are getting into with the hotels and everything. So the, the questions around what should happen when you are not able to pay for this facility and you have actually been forced to, to, to quarantine um, against your own uh, wishes. Um, this is done for, for a greater good, but then the government should be able to ameliorate such conditions. I saw somewhere somebody and his wife oh, both had a bill of 90,000 shillings for 14, uh, for 14 days in a government facility. So that's one 80,000 for a family that you didn't you hadn't plan for. So there should be those issues around the quarantine procedures, how they are being applied. I, I find it quite interesting that the government keeps on uh, extending quarantines for some facilities because people supposedly did not follow the rules. 
I find it very interesting that the government within such a contained situation is still not able to ensure rules are followed and keep on adding to the burden of uh, Kenyans to economically continue to cater for, for, for their own quarantine when other people are not respecting the rules and some are. So they are those issues around quarantine I feel are very urgent. Um, there's also issues to do with the effects of the of the of, of, of the of the lockdown measures uh, on the socioeconomic, economic uh, you know uh, status of uh, people who you know uh, for the lack of a better word I, I would say the gig economy the people who have to actually the informal laborers who have to go out every day to get uh, work so that they can be able to have a meal so there is uh, really uh, there needs to be a litigation around what strong measures are being. Um, taken around that. I know the government has said they have identified. We don't know how this was done. Uh, we don't know the measures they have put, uh, the processes they were used, who was involved. You know, again, even in this situation, our sharing of information is quite critical. We need to know everything. So the government is getting a lot of money for this. We need to know how this is being done and how the consultants are working so that we can ensure actually the people who need require this uh, assistance actually get it. Uh, okay. the issue with procurement of medicines, I've been hearing issues about around now because the, the pharmacy, um, the board, uh, the drugs and pharmacy board uh, is the one that is supposed to procure medicines uh, around for COVID. Uh, how is it happening? What's the procurement procedures looking like? Are people sh uh, are setting up shell companies to come and take uh, you know advantage of this situation? This is where openness and uh, information is very critical like who is this that has been identified to buy since around COVID? Okay. Like okay. Thanks Christine for that. Um, I really appreciate. Um, I, I want to just have Maria join us. There are questions that we have had around practice. Um, yesterday the lawyers have released a survey on um, you know how you know sort of law firms are coping with the crisis and we found that we asked um, you know, a particular demographic, and they said that 25% of them are able to pay their staff in the month of May, 75% are not able to pay their staff in the month of May. And so the options they have available include sending people on unpaid leave, some of them are looking for loans from banks, some of them are, you know, having, you know, chasing clients to pay, and some of the clients are not paying right now because, you know, there's difficulty everywhere. So how do law firms stay afloat? One, how do lawyers reinvent and now that everybody is online, how do we reinvent and how does our judicial system respond to this particular pandemic? Um, I'll, I'll mute you, Maria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Um, it's yeah. It's quite it's quite tough for law firms eh? uh, across across the board. Any any of the law firms, whether large or small, are having to adjust um, quite quite significantly. And uh, the question about how to stay afloat and uh, reinventing, uh, let me just start from staying afloat. Now, um, most practitioners do not look at their law firms as businesses. It's, um, it's never been um, quite you know, um, a priority for many law firms. So if, if, for example, you're a law firm that has actually projected on your financials for the year, then it will be easy for you to adjust. But if you've never, if you've not done it as a practice in terms of um, planning for the year and your revenue sources, then it becomes that much more difficult to, to, to stay afloat. So the first thing about uh, sending staff on uh, unpaid leave, yeah, um, that's an option. And I've seen I've seen it's been discussed in the in Sakaja's bill uh, that I, I hope members are getting so that they can give their views and their feedback. Um, but interestingly, it's, uh, you know, the bill provides that you cannot sack uh, an employee, but get into an agreement where they will go on unpaid leave, which then begs the question, what happens um, after the work resumes? And if, and if this is maybe after three, four, five, six months, um, what happens? Do you then pay uh, for the months that that uh, you know, you are not able to pay? And how will it be done? Where will the money come from? So there's a question there that needs to be addressed because you cannot give what you don't have. So for me, I think it's important for us to be alive to the fact that employers are also struggling as much as the employees because 
their all their revenue sources are also affected. Um, we have uh, you know this discussion about reinventing. So I'll go back to the business development. I mean uh, business planning. It's very important to have a a sound business plan for your law firm. And it's important for this to become a culture for, for the law firms and any any type of law firm, whether you're a sole practitioner or a small, mid-sized to large firm, so that this is a conversation you're having in your monthly uh, meetings, in your in your monthly forecasts or you know, review, and with your auditors and your accountants, so that then you look at um, how how have you positioned yourself? Are you specializing, for example, so that you know where your money is coming from. Um, I find that uh, in our discussions that we've had with law, uh, many lawyers and many law firms, this has not been something that lawyers have focused on. And it is my hope that now we will be able to do so uh, with the emerging law firms. It's a conversation we are continuously having with firms about okay. being ability to forecast and plan uh, the firm for the year or quarterly or mm -hmm. half yearly. So mm -hmm. that's important. Um, the second thing about reinventing is, has the farm digitized? So it's important for us to accept that, you know, if you were admitted like me in 2003, we kept physical files for a very long time. I know many of my colleagues and friends still uh, use physical files, but there's an opportunity now that needs to be seized. Uh, the younger lawyers who are getting admitted have, uh, you know, laptops straight from, you know, uni. So it's easier for them to have digital records and a digital law firm. So it's important for us to digitize immediately. And if you haven't, uh, take advantage of this time to do so. But then go back to the question, what about those who actually cannot afford to do it? What is the society doing um, to cushion uh, its members and get, you know, get into an arrangement with service providers where we can actually get access to you know digital solutions and uh, you know farm management solutions that are negotiated by the LSK, for example, so that you can make it easier for us to transition. Because I am of the view that this is a point of no return. Uh, we have actually been forced and thrust into the situation where we have to adopt technology in the legal profession. Um, the time has come where we should stop asking um, who moved my cheese and actually get to the program because this is not going to go backwards. If you look at the judiciary, for example, they have already gazetted the practice um, directions on e-filing, service. You know, um, If you look at the concerns that are raised by the various presidents of the KMJ or uh, you know, you know, the, the other uh, judiciary staff about uh, not interfacing with the advocates or members of the public, then it will show you that the direction that the judiciary is taking funds, uh, you know, being available, and Masharia can comment on this, is that, you know, more and more they will adopt technology and roll it out. So what are we doing as law firms to, you know, capitalize on this? And for me, what I'd say is, um, let's not miss the opportunity. Let us sit down and evaluate what is my law firm doing or what can my law firm do that the other firms are not doing um, law firms now, you know, if you're operating as a business, then you have to ask yourself, um, am I looking at efficiency? And if with efficiency comes the adoption of technology or yeah. some automation of sorts, uh, is this cost effective? And that's why I talked about um, an organization that we belong to, such as LSK, uh, mm -hmm. finding solutions where we can actually plug in and get these services uh, easily. Um, mm -hmm finding real solutions uh, within the legal marketplace. So yeah. are we uh, jacks of all trades or are we specializing? There are new areas of practice. Um, I, I don't want to just chime in there and say, yeah. um, from, from everyone's view, for a long time lawyers have been regarded if it, that if you don't go to court, then you are actually not a practitioner. And so yeah. we have a lot of lawyers stuck in commercial law litigation and not looking at new areas of practice. And yes. so from the survey we did yesterday, the, last week, we found out that those who do immigration, arbitration, um, they are not affected. Uh, they are, you know, very little is affected of their work. And those who have diversified their client base as well, because they are focusing on other markets rather mm -hmm. than just Kenyan clients, because a lot of work is still going on in the EU and in the US. People are working remotely, but they're actually still making money. 
So I think um, we could consider diversifying our client portfolio, but then also diversify our areas of practice in that particular sense. Um, and I get your comments. Thank you. Thank you for that, Maria. So I'd want to um, go to Commissioner Mashari Anjeru, um, who is going to talk to us a little bit about judiciary, what the judiciary is doing, um, how can the judiciary innovate around this particular pandemic, um, and there have been, you know, concerns around the technologies that the judiciary is using, you know, what sort of privacy measures. We also have people who are insisting that the courts need to be physically opened. Uh, is it time to reopen the courts? What do we do? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Linda. Now, um, of course, it has been challenging for everybody, as uh, all the other panelists have said. But uh, I also look at it in terms of an opportunity uh, on the part of all of us being able to use uh, technology in leveraging uh, when it comes to uh, rendering the services from whichever place that uh, we see. Now, you recall that uh, when I was contesting for this position of the male representative, LSK male representative to the, to the JSC, one of the mantras that I kept, you know, harping uh, on was the issue of uh, leveraging on uh, technology. Because I felt that uh, unless judiciary, for intents and purposes, is able to become, you know, automated, fully automated, we'll continue losing on opportunities. And it has happened elsewhere anyway. The other jurisdictions, particularly Singapore, which have been able to use uh, automation to an extent that uh, a lot of matters are argued uh, virtually without necessarily for making a physical uh, appearance in court. And now, uh, last time when uh, the government, you know, when the executive reduced the budget of the judiciary, one of the areas that was affected was uh, ICT. And uh, at that point in time, we as JSC and I was part of that uh, team, we took uh, measures of going to parliament and speaking to them directly regarding the issue of uh, automation. And uh, fortunately in that supplementary budget, we were able to have that line budget, the line item relating to automation uh, reinstated and the monies were not interfered with. And that has come in handy in terms of what we're seeing, the judiciary has been able to achieve in the in the in, the, in this time of a COVID-19. In fact, I started to think if that money had completely been taken away as previously intended by the executive, would have been in a lot of problems. So judiciary by and large uh, has been able to um, use ICT. We want it, we want it to be where it is. Yeah. You may wish yeah. to know that there is an ICT committee, uh, both at uh, the JSC level uh, which I'm part of and which I also chair and also at the part of the judiciary, they also have their own ICT committee and both are working together in terms of making sure that we fully automate. Now, in the budget that uh, for 2020, 2020, 2021, what we've also done at the JSC level is that in our meeting, we've decided to reallocate the monies and primarily to ensure that again, uh, automation is given a significant amount of money which means that what we've done is to take away budget from other items uh, of the judiciary and making sure that we allocate those monies primarily to automation. So you'll see a lot of activities, not only during this time of COVID-19, but also beyond, where we'll ensure that uh, never again should the judiciary be caught in a situation where it's not prepared. And uh, so that even beyond this pandemic, we will be able to ensure that uh, as much as possible, practice will continue being ICT driven. Okay. But having said that, we accept that there are challenges right now. The opinion is divided amongst lawyers mm -hmm. as to whether uh, there should be a total resumption of uh, court services or not. Uh, and I see this a division, a very big uh, division. The position we've taken, and uh, that's the approval that we gave in our recent meeting at the JSC, is to have uh, the open but ensuring that the health guidelines are strictly adhered to, that means that the Ministry of Health also being involved as part you know, in that process. But at the same time, to also ensure that, that whatever can be done virtually continues being done. So that is a mix of two. Now we have to remember that uh, when it comes to civil practice, a lot of it is by anyway, a lot of applicants in Supreme Court. By and large, uh, applications are by 
permissions and highlighting. So it is still possible for people to file the permission virtually, okay. be able to be given time to allow to to highlight the submissions. Yeah. That can we happen either virtually, huh? and it has to involve physical appearances in courts. It is possible to maintain social distance to ensure that only the advocates are appearing with the parties. Okay. Of course, a party is unrepresented and can come in to be fairly there in court at any given time. And to ensure that there is only a small number of people. Sorry? Okay. Um, uh, you, so it is possible to ensure that you have a small a, number some, of some people. Sort of issues. If you could just fix that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Silas had a question for Commissioner. Um, um, if you could. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner, uh, are, we, are you there, Commissioner? Yes, yes, I'm there. Okay. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you have uh, mentioned about uh, some of the initiatives that the judiciary has taken so far. Uh, as you can see uh, through the NCAJ, the Chief Justice also uh, issued uh, uh, different statements under the NCAJ and also through Gazette Notice 3137, which gives the practice directions. Uh, we can see from all these statements that, uh, that uh, the court user committee is becoming a very critical part in terms of yes. creating these uh, uh, procedures in different court stations. Uh, and you had mentioned about the challenge of uh, budget allocations. Perhaps are there any thoughts that you have had uh, regarding that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, it is possible, uh, as we speak now, for the courts to be able to operate in a manner that is uh, satisfactory uh, to the various stakeholders at, you know, in different stations. The reason why the court users committees are critical is because we cannot be able to say that uh, what happens in Nairobi can be replicated, say, somewhere like uh, Eldoret, also replicated somewhere like Akamega, or even in other smaller stations. And uh, that is why uh, it is important that uh, there is the involvement, there is engagement of all the stakeholders. And we are very clear also at the GSC that whatever measures are to be taken, let each and every station using the court users committees be able to tailor make uh, the solutions that, 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 that would apply in that particular station. And the judiciary will be able to facilitate on its part because I don't think it's anymore the issue of uh, funding because whatever funding that's available, it can still be able to ensure that the success in, uh, in respect to you know, realize access to justice. Because what we want to ensure is that uh, the courts are readily available uh, for all the stakeholders as and when they require them. We do not want it to be a situation whereby that it's the judiciary that is becoming an impediment. Okay. So as far as we are concerned with the JSC, as far as we are concerned at the GSC, you've been able to open those tabs. That's why I say that uh, even the resources that are available as we speak, we pick them from other departments and ensure that uh, ICT and uh, anything that relates to COVID-19 is being given a uh, priority. So it's not a question of uh, a funding. It's a question of making sure what is it that you can be able to do at this point in time that ensures that the health of all is uh, protected. All the stakeholders yeah. Judicial officers, but also the lawyers and the other parties who are accessing uh, justice. And what what would you say to the senior advocates who wrote to the chief justice? Uh, you know, indicating that you know they do not support the physical reopening of the courts, um, and that their physical you know uh, health would be at risk in going to the courts. We know the statistics around COVID nineteen and who is most at risk um, if they get infected. What assurance would you give them in this case? And um, yeah. I think for me, we have to listen to everybody because we, we are one legal profession. We do not want it to be seniors versus uh, the juniors. We are one profession. Now, the reality that we have to face is that, uh, of course, majority of us uh, who are senior, because I'm also fairly senior, I've now practiced for uh, 29 years. We may not be as uh, financially disadvantaged as our junior colleagues, but I always remember that I was junior at one time and had a lot of financial uh, challenges. And so when I'm looking at uh, how do we ensure that the courts are able to operate, I'm not looking at it from 
my personal point of view. I'm looking at it holistically in terms of how do you ensure that largely majority of us are satisfied and that particularly the ones who are most vulnerable. Because I feel, in fact, a lot of times when we're not level, I try as much as possible to wear the, the, the glasses of the junior lawyers because let's not be affected. There are many of them who are not even able to be guaranteed of the next meal because they have uh, salaries being cut. It is them again who are affected, which is why I said for my law firm, uh, I've, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to make us, you know, to make it, uh, you know, to make all efforts I can to ensure that they don't have their salary cuts and they don't miss on their salaries. But not many of us can be able to achieve that mm -hmm. uh, because again, the businesses have to be operational because employers are also affected. So it's a, it's a question of how we strike a balance because to me, we must ensure that courts are able to operate uh, as much as possible. Of course, mm -hmm. ensuring that the health guidelines are adhered to, but in a manner that uh, most of our colleagues in the profession, particularly the younger lawyers, mm -hmm. are able to earn a livelihood. If we don't do that, we'll also be failing them. And it is for that reason that I'm saying that, yes, we listen to everybody, but we must ensure that somewhat, uh, you know, courts are able to operate. And uh, that means that also having some bit of physical attendances. In as much as we are going to have the virtual uh, operations, but we can't totally say that we can avoid physical attendances. Mm. And it is possible to achieve it because you see, if we can ensure that there's a uh, social distancing in the courts, if we can ensure that at any given time that they hand sanitizers, that, uh, you know, because the judiciary has the capacity to make mm. provisions. And I can tell you that there's a lot of purchasing that is going on now on the mm. part of the judiciary to ensure that uh, when it comes to hand sanitizing, to ensure that uh, the cleaning of the courts, that, you know, the fumigation, Whatever it is that needs to be done to make the courts as safe as possible, that's already happening. The masks are being bought in large quantities for the staff, uh, the hand gloves. So there are many steps that uh, operationally, from the judiciary perspective, it's able okay. to use its resources to ensure that at least reasonable measures can be taken uh, mm -hmm. so that at least the courts can be able to operate. Okay. So um, I think really during... Thank you so much, Commissioner. At the end of the discussion, um, uh, I think we'll ask really about, um, is there a way that we could have more testing um, within the court premises um, that maybe would, you know, give the assurance that those who are coming in actually not, you know, um, infected or exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. Um, and also too, that, you know, there's a, a particular way that you could sieve out older, you know, judicial officers that they would they are not obligated to show up in court. I think that will be incredible and we'll be happy to hear any tools that are, you know, the judiciary is using because we know um, um, a lot of these tools are actually vendor driven where vendors actually just want to sell or give technologies to government so that they are able to, you know, get data or be able to, you know, um, do different things, which actually sometimes are, most of the time are not in public interest. So we'll be, you know, looking forward to hear from uh, that during the Q and A. Uh, my colleague yeah. Silas is going to just take over in in the next few minutes, but I want to thank you all who've joined us. Um, if you're joining, this is um, an event by the International Commission for Juris Kenya. We have. Um, Commissioner Machari Jeru from JC. We have Maria Beneka, who's a council member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. We have Patrick Mugunjiri, who is the vice chair of ICJ. And we also have Christine, who is joining us from Katiba Institute, the executive director at Katiba Institute. If you have questions and you're asking on Zoom, uh, please just go to the Q&A section and ask a question there uh, or on the chat group. Uh, I'd urge the panelists to just keep looking at the questions so that when we do our final remarks, you'll be responding to the questions that have been asked um, as we make our comments. Uh, but at this stage, I'd want to, you know, have Silas, you know, uh, from ICJ make a few comments. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, as we go, maybe uh, as we finalize on this session and going into the Q&A, perhaps I would ask the panelists to think of uh, some of the five, five issues within uh, the area that you have addressed, what are some of the takeaways that you, give, you can give us so that when we go, we can, uh, as I said, uh, engage in policy reform and uh, lobbying uh, to the relevant authorities. Mm. Uh, just to open up conversation and uh, to give Patrick Gunjiri uh, uh, the opportunity. Uh, Patrick, are you there with me? Yes, sir. yes I am. 
Ah, uh, great. Uh, you remember, I, I know you must remember that, you remember Justice Kuloba's uh, statement in, in one of his judgments that uh, uh, lawyers are not merely unscrupulous, but they are triple satanic. Uh, okay. At the end of the day, as lawyers, uh, the fact is uh, our mandate as lawyers is not merely vocational, but is, it's, it's, it's that of a public trust and that we have, an, uh, we have a responsibility to the public to give back to the public and that the public, uh, especially the vulnerable uh, people in society. So maybe you can expound and give us your thoughts about uh, what lawyers, what can we do so that we can ensure that the vulnerable, the vulnerable people in society are protected. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think when it comes to the role of lawyers in uh, in helping uh, the vulnerable people to access justice, there's there's a lot that we can do within the justice sector value chain. We have lawyers in almost all sectors. We have lawyers in practice. We have lawyers at the office of the ODPP. We have uh, lawyers who are administrators, and also we have uh, lawyers who are magistrates and judges because. Before, every ma before you become a judicial officer, first and foremost, you have to be a lawyer. So talking about vulnerability, uh, this, uh, we have to define vulnerability within the parameters of COVID-19. And doctors have told us very, very clearly that th the most vulnerable groups of people around this time of COVID are the elderly and are also those who are living with the pre-existing pre conditions. And these are the people that you have to, to take care of and have special interest in protecting their, their, their lives. Uh, we are particularly concerned, or, or as lawyers, we would be particularly concerned with those vulnerable, those among the vulnerable groups that are already incarcerated in police, police cells, in our remand homes, and also in prisons. Because uh, as a nation, what we have to do, even before we think about uh, access to justice, we need to guarantee their rights to life. We need to have these people alive so that to prevent by all means the spread of coronavirus in our, in our police cells, in our remand homes and in our prisons. So the Ministry of Interior, and uh, I'm talking about the Commissioner General of Police, I'm talking about the, the, I'm talking about the Commissioner General of Prisons, that they have to take severe measures to protect the vulnerable pe people who are within their, 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 their precincts. And they do so by following the Ministry of Health guidelines, uh, sanitizing, adequate water, social distancing, provision of free masks to all these, uh, all these inmates who are presently in the cells. But- Okay, we can hear you. How do you already uh, maintain social distances in prisons that are already crowded? Because we know even before COVID-19 struck, our prisons were congested. In a visit that was done by the Senate Affairs for Legal Committee in um, March, March 2019, the committee was shocked to find out that the capacity of, uh, the capacity of industrial area for, uh, prison was 118%. So you, you, you just figure that out. We already congested prisons holding over and above capacity and there is a, a an outbreak of coronavirus within those prisons. So we are, we are looking at as a, as a ticking time bomb. And uh, I think it will be the opportune time that uh, ICJ Kenya would call upon the Minister of Interior, the, the, Minister, of, uh, the Minister of Interior, Dr. Fred Matiangi, as well as uh, persons in charge of uh, the police and the prisons to make public to Kenyans because we are entitled as Kenyans under Article 35 of the constitution to know what measures are specifically being put in place to protect the, the vulnerable by social by effecting social distancing measures within our prisons. And that's an area that uh, is a ticking time bomb, as I have said. And in the event that we don't have, uh, these measures are not taken into consideration, then we are going to have a cat catastrophe in our, in our prisons. But I think the, sol the solution here is to decongest, 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 and decongest. I must say tribute to our judges because uh, the high court judges have taken lead in this. And in the last one month, they have actually revised very many prison uh, uh, sentences. They have uh, set petty offenders free and that way they have decongested uh, the prisons. Number two, we have not heard much from the advisory committee on the, on the power of mercy. 
This is the time, uh, this committee is established by Article 133 of the Constitution and also relevant statute, I think, the Power of Mercy Act. And I think it is time that Kenyans need to hear more that this committee is working more and more. They need to visit the prisons, make it aware that their uh, prisoners, especially the vulnerable, the elderly, are entitled to make petitions to this committee. The committee would then sit down, uh, analyze all the petitions, and in the appropriate cases, uh, it would be prudent to have to them uh, the committee to advise the president on exercise of, of uh, the, his power of mercy. This is another way that we, 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 this is another mechanism that our constitution and the law provides to ensure that we also decongest the prisons. Once the court reopens, or even if they are upscaling or downscaling, in whichever way, I, I think commissioner has mentioned very well that there has to be a modicum of operation of the courts after listening to all the, few, the, the views from the magistrates and judges and also senior counsels. There has, these courts must operate in some form, uh, there has to be some form of um, a method in which they, they, they operate. I'm talking about the diversion policy and the custodian or the movers of the diversion policy is the office of the ODPP. This is the time that uh, the ODPP working in conjunction with the probation officers, working in conjunction with the lawyers has to come, has to, uh, has to implement the diversion policy. In this policy, we'll have very many criminal cases being uh, concluded by way of compensation, restitution, expedited hearing, forgiveness, apologies, and just to make sure that, uh, that petty offenders are not languishing in uh, our prisons and becoming susceptible to getting COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, even as uh, we go, uh, even as the courts proceed with their business, I think it's time for them to, to relax bail terms uh, so that uh, majority of our people, especially those who are poor, those who are vulnerable, will be able to avoid, uh, avoid afford the, the bail terms, uh, conduct hearings where appropriate by technology. And uh, we have seen this happen after NCAJ uh, gave its directions. And also when sentencing, they should consider non-custodial sentences where, where uh, these vulnerable people will, will not be incarcerated in, in, in prisons that are already dangerous. So uh, NCAJ also, and the Honorable Chief Justice, they must give us practical directions in respect to the hearing of uh, criminal matters. Yes, they have given directions by, yes, you have some direction from NCAJ, but for them to have normative effect, it will be very prudent at this point in time that uh, we formulate practical directions to deal with criminal matters, to deal with, with, uh, with the children matters, and also to deal with anti-corruption cases. So if we take these measures, uh, especially we would now protect those people who are uh, vulnerable and they're in prisons. Court users are not just the accused persons or the lawyers or, 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 or magistrates and judges. We also have witnesses. So in circumstances where we have elderly witnesses, sickly witnesses, do we have to proceed with this case so that at, um, it is also incumbent upon judicial officers, especially where these vulnerable accused persons are out on bail to continue adjourning their matters uh, up to a point where we, this virus is under control. And okay. where we have witnesses that are elderly, witnesses that are, that are sickly, they are, they, are, they are susceptible to having coronavirus, I think it would be prudent that we don't make them travel and come to court and also to ensure that we, we, we keep them safe. Let okay. me also, in conclusion, mention a matter that uh, Christine alluded to, and this is about quarantine. I think every second year student in a school of law will tell you that uh, every sentence in law must be provided for, must be specified and provided for in a certain law. Mm -hmm. I had the, the CAS, uh, Dr. Mwangagi, the other day, allude to the fact that once you are caught whether you are going out during uh, curfew time to look for medicine or for a justifiable cause, then the punishment that you have to, to be handed up, uh, on to you is, is quarantine for 14 days. I think the government must understand that quarantine is not punishment. It is a public health measure meant to protect, to protect 
or to curb the spread of uh, uh, the spread of uh, coronavirus, so that uh, it is actually unlawful to quarantine people merely because you are out there in a curfew, and therefore this calls upon uh, for us to have, or the Ministry of Health or the powers that be, to have a mechanism by way of a tribunal where we are able to to look at these complaints as they arise. If somebody is has was genuinely out. Look, uh, then that person needs to go, not need not to go for, for quarantine. So we have to have institutionalized complaint measures that are already in place mm -hmm. to enable our citizens, especially those who are innocently going out and for a justifiable cost, they are not punished. And so that you also do not weaponize mm -hmm. the, the quarantine. Okay. Another important matter that uh, I would want to allude I think to I'm going to cut you short complaint. just because of time. Yes, yes. Yeah, just the just last statement and then, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Okay. I just wanted to mention a, a matter that is uh, very dear to SCJ over the years. We have worked on um, access to justice for many years. And um, we are finding a lot of money that is being uh, channeled towards fighting COVID-19. Money from World Bank, money from uh, private sector, money from uh, Central Bank, running into billions. I think what we want to know is uh, what is the mechanisms that are available from government so that there's openness in expenditure of this, 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 this money. Uh, Christine mentioned about uh, tendering. Who is winning these tenders? Uh, is it in the public domain? So that at the end of the day, we do not have, at the end of this coronavirus uh, thing, we don't have a, a corona gate. And the way to do it is to avail as much information to our people, as to Kenyans as possible on the expenditure. We must also, have a very precise designed criteria on who is going to benefit from government's help. Yesterday, the minister of uh, the minister, Mr. Omalo was on Citizen TV and he was at, at pains to, to respond and to answer Kenyans who is benefiting from the cash handouts, ca ca cash benefits uh, from, uh, from government. There is, there is no criteria. We need to know this criteria as who qualifies for this particular. Uh, assistance from government. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Patrick. We appreciate that. I think that was very well answered. Um, if you have any questions, we were taking questions on, you can comment on YouTube if you're watching live. And thanks for everyone who's watching us live on Facebook, on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, we also have on the chat, if you could, you know, um, ask a question. So I think uh, our panel, um, you could just go through the chat, like I had mentioned, to see if there are any questions that you want to, you know, to address. Um, but for, I'll first just um, have a few people who have, um, have wanted to ask a question. Tell us, do you have any comment as we go to the questions? Um, perhaps just a uh, uh, quick comment. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, for that. Uh, maybe as you address the Q&A uh, to Patrick and maybe any other panelists, uh, we have seen a video of one of the gentlemen who was saying that was a driver who went down to uh, uh, I think was it Kakamega, and that uh, uh, he was uh, put on forced quarantine. And uh, uh, we are aware that uh, a lot of people who have been put on forced quarantine uh, have been forced to pay for the bills. Uh, uh, perhaps in your thoughts, uh, panelists, as you address the Q&A, who should bear the cost of, uh, of, of these hotel bills and the forced quarantine? Uh, some of them have been... Uh, quarantine just next to their home, they can't even receive food. We've seen that on social media. So uh, just a, okay. a highlight uh, as we go into the Q&A. Okay, um, I'll allow Millicent to ask a question. If you're ready, Millicent. Um, yes, we'll I'm start ready. Done. Yeah, so we'll start from Millicent. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My question is uh, that we have seen all these uh, practice directions. Um, being given, especially in our civil cases. Myself, I'm a prosecutor with the uh, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, in the last one month, we have been able to conduct uh, some matters um, using uh, Skype and Zoom. We have taken pleas, we have uh, done sentences, we have also uh, done judgments, but now the challenge is how then do we ensure that at least because when we talk to when we talk about access to justice 
it doesn't end at taking pleas, for example, for those people who have been arrested. After you've taken pleas, how then can we scale, uh, scale it up to, you know, ensure some minimum um, continuity of uh, the trial process? Because once we have taken pleas, uh, you know, we are stuck at that, uh, especially um, for now. And it seems like, um, you know, the problem of uh, COVID-19 is, is not going to end anytime soon. So how do we then ensure that at least we can have some hearings going on, uh, whether, you know, online or otherwise, um, especially to, to, you know, in a bid to scale up things so that we do not just, um, you know, take please and, and wait forever, especially, you know, even if we are giving bails and the bails can be affordable to these people, yeah. You know, the fact that you're facing um, a criminal charge over your head is, is, is really, it's, it's not a good place to be so that uh, we can ensure some form of continuity. Okay. Thank you so much, Millicent Odor. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask Daniel. Um, Daniel has a question. Okay, Daniel, can you hear us? Okay. Um, okay, we'll go to Washuka. Washuka Kihenjo, you have a question. Yes, uh, my question is directed to Christine, especially in regard to the balancing of human rights. Uh, we've seen her talking about the restriction of the right to movement and the right to liberty. However, there's the right to health of the public in general that is being put at risk by people who won't follow their government directives, hence necessitating uh, putting them into forced quarantine. So how do we find the balance between these two rights? Is there one right that should be above the other? Because we've seen most human rights agency talking about the individual's right to freedom and movement and all that. Then oh. there's the, also the issue that we've seen also the public coming up and ganging against the law enforcement agencies. And we've not seen like um, human rights protection agencies talk about this. So what do they have to say about that? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rosita. Um, so I'll take the final question from Mokua Manyara. Um, okay. You can speak. We can hear. Mokua, can you hear us? Okay. Um, all right then. Um, so I think we'll we'll go into the um, the panel. You could you know um, answer the questions that have been asked on the chat, um, as well as the questions that we have been uh, you know um, asked on on the two questions by you know Washuka, and we also have another question by by Millicent. Okay, we'll go first. Um, Maria, you wanna go first? Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Linda. From the questions I've picked, I've been able to pick a few. And the first one was by Gedi. And uh, he was asking about the possibility of online CPDs by LSK and improving e-filing of the judiciary. Um, I think Mashara will assist me on the e-filing part, but I can just say a bit about uh, the CPDs, having been a council member of the LSK, um, is that um, I believe there's already something uh, in the pipeline by LSK, but this should be fast-tracked considering that uh, many members still want to um, undertake their CPDs, especially those who paid for their PCs. And uh, going by the webinars that we're having, we're having very good attendances. This is also a good revenue source for the society. It should not uh, take that much longer for, for it to be rolled out. Um, improving e-filing of the judiciary, I'd say that uh, members need to appraise themselves of the CJ's practice rules. The judiciary has done quite a bit of groundwork in terms of preparing uh, for, for the e-filing. 
I think the only outstanding issue is the rolling out across the board. But in terms of the basics, those have been done and it's good, um, perhaps uh, the judiciary can partner with the LSK to sensitize members about the actual uh, practice directions and uh, you know what law firms need to do to register for you know uh, with accounts with the judiciary and the courts that are fully um, you know doing the digitization. I've seen a comment by um, uh, you know a, a colleague here in the chat saying that the most of the courts have upscaled except for the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, and I believe our rep can take that up. Um, Jacqueline Waihenya is asking about IT professionals and uh, the credibility. Uh, my, 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 my comment would be that uh, the society has an opportunity to call for a submission or expression of interest by IT providers. Um, they can vet them given basic requirements, uh, basic minimum, so that we know um, who these are, because you have many briefcase companies that would actually disappoint. So the ICT IP committee can provide uh, basic parameters uh, in terms of criteria that the LSK can use. Members can access this information from the website and pick uh, a service prof provider of their choice. Um, she also asked, Jackie also asked about cybersecurity concerns. And uh, the basics are that anyone who is online, whether you're on your computer, or on your phone, you must have an antivirus. And this is really important for anyone who is online. The hackers use your webcams. Uh, so places like Zoom have been hacked before and I think they've now improved their security features. If you're using your webcam for Google Hangouts, for um, you know your video calls, your chats, and for Zoom meetings, you should basically have um, a waiting room feature. You should have passwords uh, sent to the individuals who are joining the meetings and not just open meetings. Um, hackers are also using phishing emails. Uh, these are emails that uh, are sent to you telling you that they have certain offers. And if you respond, um, then they have access. They gain access, especially if you don't have an antivirus, they gain access to your to your emails, they gain access to your passwords, they can then gain access to your accounts. This has happened to some of my clients where they have um, had you know, interactions with the, between themselves and their own clients and they've sent bank details, their bank details uh, that ended up in the wrong hands and their accounts were cleaned out. So don't respond to the phishing emails if it's an email address that you don't know before your best uh, place to just delete it or not respond at all until you can confirm from your client or whoever is communicating with you. Get a work email that is not, um, you know, the usual, I don't want to name names <laughs> um, of websites, but, you know, get a credible um, email address for your work, especially so that uh, then you're, you're only dealing with your clients and not, you know, gen not just every time mm -hmm. they can hurry and uh, make sure you have anti-spy anti -spy software. You also have, um, you don't leave your passwords in, on websites and, and things like that. Then there's another question um, from Asmina about registries, other, other registries opening uh, in as much as we're talking about the courts and this addresses the people who don't ordinarily practice in court. And the, I am of the view that uh, it is about time that we got, you know, registries such as the lands registry, especially, to really open up and and roll out uh, the, you know, uh, using digital platforms. You know, just the, the way BRS have done it before. You've had other other agencies such as Kipi who are also continuing with their filings. Those who are doing IP are continuing to file their documents and to do their searches. So it's not impossible. Um, if the police can give you your yeah. good conduct online, I don't see why uh, the lands registry should really be dragging so much. Ronald okay. Robo has asked about post-COVID, um, new areas of practice. I would say data protection, tech law, IP is still very, uh, a very huge area, copyrights uh, and, you know, and things like trademarks. Tax law is still not as exploited medical legal, public interest litigation is a huge area that um, advocates should take up because in, even if you're looking at the, some of the human rights abuses 
or the concerns that are coming now with this pandemic, there are many, many areas um, of public interest litigation that we should actually be following up on. And yeah. finally, digitization. Um, that's Akira Jackson who's asked about uh, lawyers have uh, been uh, fighting digitization of the lands registry. And I thought I should just correct that uh, misconception. Uh, um, actually, the, the LSK uh, through the conversing committee that is led by Peter Mwangi has done a lot of work um, through the ease of doing business team. And uh, I remember as the ICT IP committee, we were called in to give our feedback on where we thought the gaps were and making it easier for us to access uh, the work. It is also a misconception that uh, generally uh, that lawyers are not, you, you know, we are the ones who adapt to the cost of doing business. And we've seen this across the board. You saw it uh, with the registration of companies and that's how we found ourselves locked out of the process. What I want to say to the government of Kenya is this, lawyers like any other professional are interested in efficiency. We are interested in uh, livelihoods and making sure that the processes are as smooth as possible. What government should, should be doing is facilitating every part or every, every player to ensure that the process is smooth. Then uh, ensure that uh, you know, all these processes take into account our different rules. Because if you lock out lawyers, for example, from the conveyancing process, uh, what you end up doing is postponing the problem because most of these transactions end back in court because either searches were not proper or the, uh, whether land control boards, which is still a very contentious issue, whether or not, and I think that's been taken out uh, from, from some communication I saw. What, okay. What was the mischief that was intended to be cured by having an LCD, for example? So in as much as we want to automate, we must be aware of the risks that our clients and members of the public can fall prey to. And that's why legal services are important. And they must, they must be mainstreamed in those processes. OK. Um, thank mm -hmm. you very much, Maria. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, say, first of all, um, Duncan Ondimu says your home office is really beautiful. Um, so I, I hope it's not the, the virtual background on, YouTube, on Zoom, um, but that's it. And uh, thanks for everyone else who's joining us. Isaac Okero, the former president of the Law Society as well, um, is joining us as well. So if I didn't mention your name, please don't be angry, but um, I just got to see those particular messages. Um, so I want to thank you for joining us. We're just going to go to Commissioner uh, Mashari Anjeru. Um, there are questions that have been asked around the judiciary. Um, I hope you can you know, answer them. Uh, but then also, um, it's it's important for us to, you know, talk about if this persists, you know, and gets worse. What happens? What happens if we close down the courts and have to go remotely? You know, I, is the judiciary ready for this? Yeah, and okay. And Silas has a question yeah, as well. Perhaps just to also uh, add on uh, on Linda's question. Uh, I mean, we can see across uh, the world, uh, judges and magistrates embracing technology in different interesting ways. You can see like, for example, uh, Judge Peram in Australia uh, in, the, in, in a case uh, between Capis and Ford uh, company, embracing technology in very interesting ways and defending it uh, very fiercely saying that, uh, that there are all these uh, concerns about security, but yes, these are technologies that lawyers have been using and that uh, judges have been using even behind the scenes. So uh, just to hear from you, uh, Commissioner, uh, as you uh, wind up and uh, answer Linda's and some of the Q&As, maybe just to shed light on that. Thank you. Okay. And um, so I think, Commissioner, I'll have you answer that question. Uh, there's been um, something trending this week on social media. Um, our, there's a judge, I think, in the U.S. who, you, um, uh, you know, he spoke to some of the lawyers who, who appeared before them, before him, and he said that lawyers need to dress up, even for Zoom hearings. Yes. Um, so some of us are putting on coats on top, and then at the bottom there's nothing, um, and maybe rubber shoes like I'm wearing. So um, are there like a, a particular, this is there a particular way we need to appear before the judges, even if we are appearing remotely? So you can answer, I think, all those. Okay. 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 I, I can take I can take the questions now. Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now let me speak uh, 
particularly to the issue of if the courts were to totally go remote, uh, to work remotely, whether they are, they are ready. Now, uh, we must be alive to the fact that um, not all the stations can reasonably say that they are ready. There is significant, there's a significant number of stations, particularly the ones that are in urban areas that can manage to do that. Uh, I have my serious doubts as to the ability of the, all the stations to do that, particularly in far-flung uh, areas. The reason why uh, I say this, let's remember that the, the issue of uh, uh, internet connectivity, which is not uniform all over the country, the, the issue of uh, you know, availability of power and also the backup, uh, there are many other issues you know, around it. So we, we are not there yet. But if you are talking about stations here, like for instance, Nairobi, Mosa, and Nakuru, and others, uh, it is possible to do that. Of course, again, we can't say that uh, because this is. Let's remember that this COVID nineteen uh, came in, a, in not only in a very unprecedented manner. We're losing you. But was expected it. So, today it's. Okay. Hello? Can um, you hear yeah. me? There's a there's a problem with your your internet. Maybe I, yeah, I don't know. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. You, you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay. So I was saying that uh, COVID nineteen came a little bit too fast. So we can't say that uh, judiciary, which has lagged behind you, because we must we must accept that judiciary by and large had been left behind when it comes to automation. But there are, there are serious attempts now that have been made and this progress that has been made. So the larger stations will be able to do that. But I will not say the same of the smaller stations, particularly where there's the issue of internet connectivity, uh, the issue of power, you know, etc, etc. So there's a lot of work to be done around that. But as we speak now, I do not think that uh, we, are in a, we face an immediate danger of a total shutdown, uh, unless of course something drastically changes. So. To me, it's more of a lesson learned that we should be able not realize that the issue of automation is a, is a, is a key priority, which is why I say that uh, from the JSC perspective, when we were approving the budget that released now to the judiciary, we were able to pick resources from other uh, budget lines and reallocate that, giving priority now to the issue of automation. So you should be able to see a lot of progress regarding that going forward, even as we are working with our current uh, situation. And that is a key priority. And uh, so to me, what I would say that uh, also the law firms must be equally prepared. So that, because we must also accept that there has been challenges where judiciary is able to render the service, but the lawyers themselves are not ready. There has been some law firms that have been asked for details. They are not able to avail them, or they do not have the capacity on their side. So the two must go together. But by and large, I'm quite confident that as we move forward, uh, judiciary should be better prepared uh, than it is now, but it is still able to render services even with the current uh, capacity that it has. The issues of security, of course, that is uh, quite critical for the judiciary. I don't want to speak so much into that, but that is uh, something that, of course, is being looked into in terms of ensuring that uh, as the services are being rendered, that uh, again, there's no possibility of hacking or information that is otherwise supposed to be confidential gets out there to the public. I believe that is an area that is being given a you know, key priority. And maybe e filing is already happening. Here, what's what's confidential about, there's been questions around, if you're talking about security and privacy for judiciaries, um, what's private other than family matters, for example, what else is, is private? Uh, can't we open up the courts, even if it's remote, to still have people who are watching briefs, People who are conducting research and things like that still join in um, on, on, on the, with the courts going online. What, what are your thoughts? You see, the thing is that uh, we are not just talking about uh, judiciary and uh, the stakeholders, the members of the public or the lawyers and all that. Remember, there's also the internal communications within the judiciary that must continue happening. And sometimes whatever is happening in operational matters, that relate to the judiciary itself, that really open to the plea. So there has to be a way that the judiciary can be able to also run its operations uh, in a manner that is uh, confidential, guarding also uh, the interest that relates now to the judiciary, 
that would, where the public would also be affected if such matters you know, become a matter of a public domain. Mm -hmm. So we, we shouldn't just be looking at it from the perspective of the uh, you know, judiciary and the lawyers. Let's also think about the internal communication, that the internal operations of the judiciary that must largely also be a protector. Just the same way, Linda, your own personal operations in your business would need also to be secured. So that's primarily the perspective from which you know I'm speaking from. Or even communication, you can imagine a situation whereby a judge is in a panel, before they come up with a decision, they are discussing and they are discussing it also remotely. You don't go to a situation whereby the thoughts that are being exchanged uh, suddenly become a matter of uh, public uh, discourse. Uh, so security is a very critical area that has to be looked at and it can't, it can't really be ignored. But now coming to the issue that had been raised about uh, e-filing, uh, as I said, that is an area, judiciary has done quite well when it comes to the e-filing. It's already happening, except of course for a good number of uh, stations that uh, are in far flung areas where I talked about the issues of uh, connectivity. But the much busier stations and larger ones, I don't think that should be a critical area that uh, should worry us. It's already happening and to continue, of course, uh, being a, uh, made even better to make sure that uh, post COVID, we continue doing it now, even without that challenge, that becomes now the norm. We must realize that uh, all of us, that there is what now would be calling the new normal. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit that you get is out of automation, we should continue with them, regardless of whether you know, COVID-19 uh, is behind us sooner than, than, uh, than later. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much, Commissioner. Um, we appreciate that. I think we'll go to Christine. Um, and then wrap up the discussion with, uh, with Patrick. Um, yeah, yes, but... Christine, can you hear us? Christine? Uh, can you hear me, Linda? Yes, yes I can. Yes. Thank you. I think I'll start with the question from what was Hani Mashuka, I think. Um, on the issue of balancing of rights, uh, you know, the general, uh, you know, rights to everybody health, And then there's the issues to do with the measures that are being in place to contain the spread uh, of COVID-19. I think we can all agree that Kenya historically has had a lot of problems um, that now are being made even more um, sharper uh, because of the COVID-19. We've always had problems in delivery of health services in our country. We've always had problems uh, with police brutality. Uh, we've had problems with procurement uh, for government services. We've had uh, problems with openness and disclosure of information from the government. We've had issues with wealth disparity, and now you know the uh, welfare support uh, services to you know to to Kenyans who need it. So that that is now becoming quite evident just because of this COVID nineteen. And of course, those situations will continue to to be with us even during this COVID-19 and after. It's now uh, looking at the lessons we learned from this uh, COVID-19 and looking at how then we can now later on make policies and laws to address the issues that will have come up again during this COVID-19. So in the issue of whether we balance between penalizing uh, people who do not adhere to the guidelines but so as to protect the general health of everyone, I do agree that we need to learn lessons from other countries that have done, have dealt with similar situations. And I'm talking about epidemics or pandemics like Ebola. And what we learned from those situations is that when you criminalize actions uh, and measures uh, around uh, dealing with uh, epidemics, then there's usually some sort of social backlash uh, by the people. You actually want people's buy-in and people input and voluntary action to deal with pandemics. That's the thing that works as opposed to criminalization of everything. Uh, first of all, also because it goes counter to what we've been trying to say here, and that is to decongest the prisons and to reduce uh, uh, people coming uh, into the criminal justice system. Um, so anyway, for me, what uh, is really critical is whatever measures that are coming in, especially in uh, uh, restricting movement and liberty, they have to be clear, very narrow, uh, and have offer options for review so that the police and the Minister of Health is not the only people who will make certain decisions. A measure of review 
whether administratively or at the judiciary, so that people are able to challenge any of those decisions that are reached in terms of their liberty and in terms of uh, their right to movement uh, as, as may be restricted. Um, and so uh, what we have then is to provide that uh, second layer of review of decisions. So because, for example, we know that you are placed in quarantine because A, or you are isolated because A, you exhibit uh, symptoms, you have COVID and, or you're exhibiting symptoms of COVID or you're in close, you've been in close contact uh, with somebody who has uh, COVID. So just uh, picking up anybody from the street and just immediately taking them to quarantine without any of these factors being uh, a determinant is actually not a reasonable action, I would say. And actually taking them to quarantine is most likely going to uh, you know, uh, increase their chances. Uh, of getting uh, of getting COVID, so there needs to be a measure of review and to follow, you know, uh, uh, medical practice in terms of people who are supposed to be quarantined or isolated. So okay. that's and, what and Christine, I'm just wondering. Sorry to cut you short. Um, we are running a little bit out of time, but I'd want to ask: um, Is there any possibility that Katiba Institute could, you know, together with ICJ and other partners, is it possible to take up the issue of quarantine? Um, and see, you know, the people who are suffering from this, the people who are sending videos from these particular centers that they are in, on, you know, um, mandatory quarantine. How do we help? How do we help yeah. the story about the musician who was going to buy medicine for his wife? How do we yeah. intervene as fast as we, we can? Yeah, so actually we are in the process of doing something around this. Uh, and so we are trying to uh, formulate a PIL around this issue and hopefully uh, within this week we'll be able to do something about that. We are in the process of trying to get witnesses and statements and all that and, it's the, and it takes a little bit of time but actually it's something that is being done. But just to add on to also some of the things that I've seen is uh, issues to do um, with removing as much discretion as possible from the police and providing a second layer of uh, input uh, to the courts. Um, I think also we've spoken a lot about the courts being reopened from tomorrow, but for me, if, if I'm sending out a staff of Katiba Institute to go and litigate a PIL case tomorrow, I'd want to know what is the procedure to be followed from when I leave my, I, when I access the gate of the Milimani law courts uh, mm -hmm. to when I go out. It needs to be very clear. Do we all come for case conferencing to be able to be told you are cases to be had at 10, 11, 12? It needs to be a little bit clear that were scheduled for hearing later tomorrow uh, yeah. before COVID happens. So it needs to, we really need to know what's the procedure to follow once I get to the gate of the in the money law courts. I also oh. wanted to uh, talk about issues to do with the yeah. uh, access. So I'm going to give you a minute just because we have to wrap yes. up. Right. So the issue of digitization and access to information. You know, the Access to Information Act had given about three years uh, since 2016 for all uh, government uh, processes to be digitized. And if we had done that, then things would have been a little bit better right now. For example, if I send now, I, I, because of this restriction of movement, I really do not want to go to uh, send access to information letters to the ministries. What I would send it to the email provided, there's not even an email all the requests that we've sent out to using their email contacts of the request that's been um, received and responded to. So yeah, there are those issues that are coming. Uh, even COVID now, we'll have to see how uh, that can be addressed. Um, okay. Um, thanks, Christine, for that. Uh, that's Christine um, Konge from Katiba Institute. Um, so I'm going to have Patrick Mbunjiri, um, our final panelist, who's going to take up a few questions. And we've run out of time. Um, but I also recognize everyone else who's joined us on YouTube. Um, this is the ICJ event, ICJ Kenya. And we're just talking about the impact of COVID-19 on legal practice and how lawyers can adjust um, and serve public interest. Um, and so um, Patrick, I'm going to just have you um, answer a few questions from the chat. Um, sorry, Patrick. Um, are you okay? Can you, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Can, you can hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I'll give you three uh, minutes. Think, uh, not very many questions were directed to me, but I yeah. think I would want to have the session by you're blocking your camera. actually challenging uh, law firms to wake up and smell the coffee. Last year, or 2018, I had occasion to attend um, a meeting of uh, leading law firms in uh, Zanzibar, although mine is not a leading law firm. And uh, I think what came up, uh, what came up 
in that session was that um, about 80%, 80 to 70 percent of legal work that is uh, meant for Africa, that is uh, meant for Africa, uh, for African continent, is actually conducted by lawyers in Western capitals, in Paris, in London, in uh, New York, and in um, such countries. <laughs> so that um, it is time that we innovate and we start uh, thinking about new areas of law. Yeah. Uh, you can guess that for every economic activity around the world, there's a lawyer involved in this, this thing or the other. So we need to look at uh, things like uh, e-discovery. E-discovery these days is multi-billion business in the US and in Europe as well as Australia. We need to look, look at uh, legal outsourcing. Law firms have really thrived through legal outsourcing in, in India, in yeah. Philippines, in uh, Singapore. And uh, as long as we keep, we keep uh, being entrenched in the traditional practice that we undertake here in Kenya, then even our lifespan as a legal firm uh, is not, it's not very, it's, it's, the future is not very promising. Lastly, okay. because we have been talking about uh, access to um, Patrick, you're blocking your mic so we can hear you. Can't hear me? You're blocking. Yeah. Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? We yes, can Patrick, hear you. We can, can hear you. you. Yes. Yes, you're uh, okay. The last point is that uh, in this session, we have been talking about access to justice. Uh, last week, I was reading the State of Judiciary and the administration of justice report. Um, sorry, pa Patrick, you're blocking your mic with your hand, so we can't hear you. Don't block your microphone. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. 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 Just remove your hand and you're good you're okay to go. Now. You can speak now. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you're okay, now you can speak now. Um, yes. Yeah, you can speak now. You're good. You can hear me now. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. I think I'm also getting technolog technological yeah. challenge. I was talking comment. about the state of, uh, state of um, judiciary and the missing of justice report that was released by the judiciary in 20, for 2018-2019. And uh, this report was very categorical that uh, in the reporting year, that is 2018-2019, judiciary was operating at 55% of its human resource requirements. So that if we expect judiciary even to come around for us, even around this time of conflict, then it is high time that parliament and the executive fully resourced the judiciary in terms of the funds that they have asked for, and also in terms of the appointment of judges. It is also the high time that we call upon the president to appoint the 41 judges that were forwarded for appointment by the JSC last year. And this will go a long way in providing rights to access to justice to all Kenyans, especially at this difficult time. It is his duty, it is his prerogative, it is his duty under the constitution to do so, and we are calling upon him to uphold the constitution and yeah. respect the courts and swear these judges as soon as possible. Lastly, lawyers, yeah. please, let us let's take pro bono, pro, pro bono cases at this point in time. I was reading an article in press uh, yesterday that Patrick, you have to uh, finish. Maria. I think last year she visited a prison in, in, um, in uh, Nyahururu town. Yeah. And I think she made a finding that uh, why we have overcrowded prisons in Kenya is because uh, people have been convicted because they did not have legal representation before the hearing, before the sentence. Yeah. So I'm now renewing this call as juries, as members of ICJ, Please yeah. let us take as many pro bono cases now, as soon as many as we can. So I'm being okay. signaled that you're out of time, but uh, I've enjoyed yeah. this session. It has been very informative. I look yeah. forward to having many more of such mm -hmm. in future. Thank you, Lida and oh. uh, Silas. I know the panel. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Patrick. You. You, Patrick. I'm, I'm going to just allow um, Alan to join us. He's the former, um, so sorry, President Emeritus of the Law Society of Kenya. Um, and I'm going to just uh, have him, um, you know, um, make a few comments. And if he has a question, uh, he'll do that very fast as we as we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Linda. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alan. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, sorry, I came in late. Um, my main concern has been that uh, we have been going through this uh, with knee-jerk reactions. 
we don't have a concerted effort of how we can confront the uh, serious problems we are facing at the lands office and also in the judiciary. We're getting different practice directions uh, from the judiciary and um, we all left confused. Let me start with the lands office. Um, there have been numerous meetings, uh, but uh, we've not had anything from lands saying that they've been in consultation with the MOH yeah. Yeah. to find out uh, how we can reopen and start uh, business as usual. The government is already losing billions of shillings in stamp duty. We are losing a lot of work and so are our clients. We go to the NTSA, which is supposed to digitize logbooks. They're not being uh, produced. Now, my view is we need to get to get, get our act together, get um, a team, an ad hoc committee that will address all these issues systematically. If we don't do that, our practice is really going to die in the next couple of weeks. And one thing we have to appreciate, this COVID thing is going to be here for a long, long time. It's not going to go away next month. Let's be realistic. We may be with it until next year. So unless we come up with an emergency ad hoc committee dealing with, let's say, the judiciary, another dealing with uh, lands, and coming up with um, uh, suggestions and ways of um, bringing it up, uh, working remotely and registration of documents, we are really going to see 100% of the law firm shut down in the next uh, two, three months. That's all mm -hmm. I have to say. Okay. Thanks, Alan, for that. And thanks for the service to the Law Society. We appreciate it. Um, I think the last um, council as well, there was a lot of interventions on technology, which now we see why we should have even engaged better as a membership and members of the, you know, the ICT committee. So I just want to have, um, you know, Silas make his closing remarks as well. And uh, we can wrap up this particular discussion. Thanks for joining us. We've had about 200 class lawyers join us online. Yeah. Uh, we also have, I think about 100 people joined us on YouTube. And I'd want to thank Rene Ngamau on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Chacha Odera, thank you. Dan Kanundimu. Um, thanks for everyone who's joined us and those who have asked questions as well. I think this discussion is timely. Uh, we are informed that the, um, you know, the Chief Justice is just about to address, uh, to do a live uh, press conference at two o'clock on, uh, I think, practice directions and what, what comes next. So um, I, I'd urge you to maybe tune in and be able to um, engage and know what are the next steps for, for the judiciary. Silas, you have a few comments. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, that's over 300 lawyers across yeah. Yeah. across the country that have joined us today. I can see that we have, uh, we have had very deliberate, I mean, very good deliberations. I can see uh, 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 Jerry Gasheru saying that this has been quite informative and challenging to me, especially in uh, practice post COVID. Uh, uh, another Zaina Combo saying, uh, very insightful dis uh, discussions. COVID-19 has taught us, all of us, that there's an urgent need to embrace technology, uh, even post-COVID-19, and tap into the potential to enhance access to justice. Uh, someone says, I agree with Maria, land registries should be op opened. Let them embrace digitization. Um, uh, I think this must be Lina Sarapai saying, there, might, there should be a deeper bar bench and CUC engagement uh, re, uh, to build uh, on ICT gains. Uh, so from what we are seeing is that lawyers across the country are saying digitization, digitization, yeah. digitization. Okay. Uh, there are other very important uh, questions that are being asked by lawyers about uh, security. Someone saying digitization appears to be inevitable. Are there any pointers as to which products to use uh, and which providers are reliable? Uh, someone else is asking what cybersecurity concerns are prevalent, which are systemic and which are specific. So I, I think uh, from what comes out of this discussion is that there is need for both the judiciary and uh, related organs like the tribunals, as well as law firms to embrace technology. Okay. Uh, just to say thank you so much on behalf of uh, the ICJ Kenya Council, uh, ICJ Kenya Secretariat, uh, back, I, I know I, I would have said back in the office, but now it's back in, the, in our homes. Uh, thank you so much for finding time to join us uh, in this webinar. This is the first, uh, first webinar we are holding under ICJ Kenya, and I would like to really express my appreciation to the lawyers for having uh, collaborated with us. Uh, in such a short time to pull off this webinar. Uh, we are hoping that we will come up with a communique and that uh, will uh, sort of uh, come up with the recommendations 
that will be addressed to the relevant authorities so that we can uh, push uh, some of the recommendations that you, you've given us here on this discussion uh, moving forward. Okay. As we move on, please uh, continue engaging us at on Twitter, on Facebook, on our uh, social media pages at ICJ Kenya and at Lawyers Hub Kenya. Okay. Uh, I think uh, with those few remarks, just to say that next week, we hope to have another one. Uh, if uh, I hope that we'll partner with Lawyers Hub or uh, ICJ or Lawyers Hub, um, uh, or maybe any other uh, organization that will be willing to join. Uh, we welcome you. We, we hope to address other issues, including uh, what law firms actually require, what lawyers actually require moving forward. Uh, what are some of the recommendations in terms of software uh, practice, uh, going to the nitty gritties of practice? Uh, what do you need as a young lawyer? What do you need as a, as a, law, uh, as a law firm that is ready uh, in, 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 in practice? Yeah. Uh, what do you need to change over? Okay. Uh, there are other issues that we, we will uh, also discuss about, uh, especially issues of mental health and lawyers. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Silas. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. I don't know whether any of my panelists have a parting shot. I will give you exactly one minute um, so that we can finish up right now. Um, I'd also want to, you know, just thank you and say there are questions about what are the solutions, you know? Um, the people asking us, you know, what are the solutions to this? What, what did you offer solutions? And I want to say, um, there are solutions, yes, we can't exhaust them in one hour, but we wanted to just look at, you know, the, you know, kickstart the conversation and see what are the solutions that we can get, you know, long term. I agree on the cybersecurity issue. There's been, you know, we did a survey and we found that 64% of the lawyers were actually concerned about cybersecurity. And so it means that that's an, a matter that we all must engage in and look for technologies and tools, as well as policies that will help us to, you know, um, encourage uh, cyber security. So uh, to my panelists, just exactly one minute and then we wrap it up. Maria. Okay. Great. Um, way forward, um, I believe the Law Society is uh, very well positioned through the national office and the branches to quickly uh, use the, 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 the force of numbers to get very competitive packages and solutions for our members and especially those members who have not digitized and are willing to do so now. Um, secondly, um, look for a partnership with the SACO, perhaps to, because I believe the SACO had come up with a, with a business um, support um, package that can now be used uh, at this time. So I'd, I would encourage our members to join the SACO, take advantage of uh, the products that the SACO is offering and use okay. it now to expand the business uh, in terms of the technology. Uh, another way forward is that we, we really must um, em embrace uh, technology across the board. Uh, um, all government services, especially where lawyer services are required, and uh, partner with organizations such as ICJ, Kituo Chasheria, uh, Kenya National Human Rights Commission to ensure that um, we don't have people who are still stuck uh, in, in the prisons in, in terms of plea taking and support okay. our representatives at the at the at the um, the judiciary, our representatives at the JSC to come okay. up with the credible solutions that can be adopted. Okay. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to go to uh, Commissioner Masharangeru. No, for me, um, what I can say is that uh, you can rest assured, I can give an assurance to uh, members of the legal profession that uh, we'll continue ably representing your interests and ensuring at least in terms of uh, your ability to be able to engage with the judiciary and uh, run your practice from wherever you are is not hindered, notwithstanding the COVID-19. Hmm. Now, I can assure you that uh, the issue of uh, digitization is one that uh, personally I'll continue taking a lead in so that uh, post COVID-19, we're able to take our, you know, the legal practice to the next level. It's an area that can also ensure that uh, we are not only efficient, but in terms even also of uh, managing our expenses uh, becomes you know, easy. So I rest assured that uh, this, 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 a very, um, this key priority that are being looked into in that area uh, as I said earlier on, that even uh, when we had our budget approval meeting at the JSC level for the judiciary, 
we took the you know the decision that it was important to reallocate resources to ensure that priority is given uh, to ICT. So prepare yourselves on your side, even as judiciary prepares itself. And I can assure you that this has been a very good learning experience in as much as COVID-19 is something we'd rather not have encountered. Okay. God bless you. Let's keep together. Let's maintain one profession. It's in our interest for us to be united. Even as we have diverse opinions, at the end of the day, we are legal practitioners and we want to ensure that everybody, everybody's interests are taken into, into consideration. Thank you very much for the invite and the okay. participation in these uh, this, uh, discussions of today. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner. We have Christine, who's going to make a final comment. Sorry, there's uh, some planes flying above us, so it's, it's pretty loud. Uh, but Christine, you could go ahead before we finish up with um, Patrick. Okay, thank you, Linda. Just as, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Right, great. So just like uh, uh, Maria and Mashari have said, I think it's true, let's continue engaging with the NCJ, LSK, and JSC to continue offering our, our suggestions and solutions uh, as this crisis unfolds. Also looking towards other jurisdictions, similar jurisdictions, South Africa, UK, Australia, and others, and how they are dealing with uh, uh, doing litigation and justice, justice sector during this COVID time. Let's continue learning uh, from this other jurisdictions and see how we can tailor make uh, those solutions to fit our uh, particular circumstances. And as Maria has said, also, I know there are law firms, out, not law firms, NGOs, that also do uh, litigation similar to, to uh, legal practice like artisans there. And just wanted to mention there are uh, options for those NGOs to be able to get software at subsidized prices, packages at subsidized prices. Uh, from uh, companies out there, including Microsoft and all of that. And so they, we can have more opportunities on, on how they can uh, be able to access, uh, you know, uh, subsidized uh, software packages uh, for, for ins institutions doing uh, charitable uh, work. Okay. And Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Linda. All right. Thank you very much. And we go um, to Patrick. Who is the vice chair of ICJ? Who will make the closing remarks um, and a vote of thanks as well, Patrick. Thank you, Linda. Though I can barely hear what's going on, uh, but uh, we have uh, enjoyed this session. Uh, it's a wake-up call to us in ICJ, where we'll be needed to take action, especially in challenging. We have uh, challenging the draconian laws that are coming in because of the COVID COVID nineteen. ICJ is always ready and willing to take up those briefs. We have worked closely with the Katiba Institute in the past, and I don't, I, I, I know that even now we will cement and have a, a more concrete working relationship with Katiba and other like-minded institutions in terms of challenging these uh, draconian laws. So I agree because uh, I have had challenge with the, with, the, with the listening to this last bit of it. I agree with the sentiments, closing sentiments by Maria, by our mm -hmm. senior commissioner, Macharia, and Christine, I have nothing else useful to add. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I think at this particular point, I would just want to say thank you to everyone else, our panelists. Thank you for joining us and for your question. Thanks to ICJ for putting this together. And I just want to say from the Lawyers Hub, we are happy to collaborate. I think um, this should be the attitude within the sector. It's, that, it's a time that you know, Katiba Institute, Amnesty International, everyone else who's working within the legal profession needs to come up and support the judiciary in the work that they're doing. We need to offer pro bono services. I like the call by Patrick that we need to engage and take up some pro bono cases. I think it's an excellent time to do that. Absolutely. It's not a time to you know, shine alone, but to see how we can all synergize Absolutely. and ensure that people actually get justice. We expand the pie and ensure that people, uh, lawyers in practice actually see the new opportunities that are available. Those who do not understand technologies, seniors that are struggling to you know, take up tools, tech tools, for example, low firms, small low firms that do not know how to pay their staff. We need to all come together and figure out solutions for this particular, you know, pandemic. At the Lawyers Hub, we are happy and open to collaborations, and we Thank hope you. that we can get this discussion going. Thank you so much. Silent. Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, I said uh, before, thank you so much, Lawyers Hub, uh, and uh, thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to everyone who has been able to join us. Uh, please do not forget to con continue this conversation on our social media at ICJ Kenya and at Lawyers Hope uh, Kenya. 
please, uh, the, the questions that you have asked on uh, Zoom, you can copy paste them on uh, our social media. And I would uh, encourage our panelists to attempt to answer all these questions. Uh, also remembering that we'll come up with a communique that we we'll send that we will send out to uh, the relevant authorities, asking them for uh, some of the recommendations that we have given. Okay. Uh, thank you so much and have a nice uh, afternoon. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks for joining us. My name is Linda from the Lawyers Hub. Um, I hope you can join us on social media. So we'll stop the live stream on YouTube, but if you are on the webinar on, you, on Zoom, please continue to interact. Uh, we'll give you a few 10 to 15 minutes so that we interact and get to know each other on the um, on, and network uh, uh, virtually. 